This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by Black Magic Design, creating the world's highest quality solutions for feature film, post-production, and television broadcast industries. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and in this lesson we'll look at how early Soviet filmmakers established the theory of montage, an editing style that assembled together different shots that added a new, sophisticated element to cinematic language. At the end of the First World War, Russia was in disarray. The Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, had overthrown the Tsar in 1917, and the country of 160 million people, mostly poor and illiterate, was torn apart from years of civil war. The first task of the ruling party was to consolidate and communicate, and they turned to film as a mass communication medium. But the producers and the technicians of the pre-revolutionary cinema were capitalists, and most of them were driven out or uncooperative with the Bolshevik government. Film resources were scarce. What little they had was consolidated in a cinema committee within the New People's Commissariat of Education. Headed by Lenin's wife, the cinema committee founded a film school to train new filmmakers, the VGIK, All Union State Institute of Cinematography, or the Moscow Film School, as came to be called. This was founded in 1919 and would become the world's first film school. Now the school's primary function was to train people to make films in support of the Bolshevik political party, making newsreels for the purposes of agitation and propaganda, agitprop. But the Moscow Film School wasn't only a communist mouthpiece. Faculty were also interested in the theory of film. One of the school's co-founders, Lev Kuleshov, would bring new insight into the psychological workings of motion pictures. Lev Kuleshov was one of the few pre-revolutionary filmmakers to remain in Russia after 1919. Working as a newsreel cameraman during the revolution, Kuleshov was instrumental to the founding of the VGIK. But Kuleshov's superiors at the film school didn't think the young 20-something could work well in a traditional curriculum setting. So they let him conduct his own study group outside the formal structure of the school. This study group became known as the Kuleshov Workshop and attracted the more radical and innovative film students. With film stock being so rare, Kuleshov spent most of his time making films without celluloid, writing scenarios and assembling actors in a sort of mock filmmaking exercise. But their studies would take a major turn when D.W. Griffith's Intolerance played for the first time in Moscow in May of 1919. Lenin loved Intolerance for its plea for the proletariat and agitational quality, so he ordered it to be screened all across the Soviet Union. Intolerance not only became the most influential film in Russia for the next 10 years, but also a subject of deep, intense study at the Kuleshov workshop. They dissected D.W. Griffith's editing style, even deconstructing the shots themselves, reassembling them in hundreds of different ways to examine the impact that different edits had. Once new film stock was becoming available in 1922 as a result of a Soviet-German trade agreement, Kuleshov was ready to experiment with some of the lessons learned from studying Griffith's film. The first experiment would illustrate what has become known as the Kuleshov effect. Kuleshov took a shot of an expressionless face and created a short film, combining the face with a bowl of hot soup, a woman in a coffin, and a seductive girl on a couch. Now he showed this film to audiences and they raved about the range of emotion the actor portrayed from pensiveness and hunger at the thought of long forgotten soup to sadness and mourning at the loss of a loved one taken far, far too early to lust and forbidden desire over the beautiful, sexy girl. Even though we know the shots are exactly the same, audiences read emotion into the actor's face by the nature of the shots around it. In another experiment, Kuleshov took three shots, an actor smiling, a close-up of a revolver, and the actor looking frightened. Shown to an audience, the interpretation was that the actor was growing cowardly. But reverse the order of the shots, and now the audience interprets the actor as growing brave, 
It's the exact same three shots, but the order changes the meaning. Though other filmmakers like D.W. Griffith had practiced this type of editing instinctively, Kuleshov was the first to put it into theory. The meaning of the film was not only in its spatial reality, how things are arranged in a frame, but in the film strip itself, the sequence of the shot. To further push the boundaries, Kuleshov experimented with artificial landscapes through creative geography, cutting together pieces of film captured in totally different locations. Kuleshov could create a believable, fictionalized geography in a film that didn't exist in real life. This was a departure from the continuity editing of the West that sought to smooth cuts with techniques like cutting on action and the 180 degree rule. Kuleshov was demonstrating that the film could transcend space and time, that the viewer could construct the geography in their own heads as they were watching the film. To Kuleshov, the creation of film didn't start when cameras rolled. That was just getting the raw material. A film is born in the edit, which the Soviets called montage, from the French verb monter, which means to assemble. This montage theory would see even greater refinement by one of Russia's most famous silent filmmakers and student, brief student of the Kuleshov workshop, Sergei Eisenstein. Sergei Eisenstein along with D.W. Griffith are the two pioneering geniuses of early cinema. Though Griffith would create the language of continuity editing through practice and practical problem solving, Eisenstein would approach film intellectually. Griffith and his American contemporaries used film and editing techniques to enhance emotional impact, almost as, a, as an extension of 19th century theatrical methods. Whereas Eisenstein used editing to break free of the confines of time and space and communicate abstract ideas in a new and modern way. Battleship Potemkin would be Eisenstein's most critically acclaimed and influential film. Shot in 1925 as a 20th anniversary of the 1905 revolution against the Tsar, Potemkin took 10 weeks to shoot with the famous Odessa step sequence shot in seven days. The editing took another two weeks to accomplish. Running 86 minutes long, Potemkin contained 1,346 shots. Battleship Potemkin was an international success, a clear win for Eisenstein and his use of montage to elicit emotional response from the viewer. So influential was the film that Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels called it a marvelous film without equal in cinema. Anyone who had no firm political conviction could become a Bolshevik after seeing the film. The film was pure propaganda, but the best propaganda ever made. Key to Potemkin's success was the editing, which is where Eisenstein begins to articulate his most important contribution to film theory. Eisenstein, a true intellectual and Marxist, saw montage as a process which operated in the same way as a Marxist dialectic, which is a way of looking at history as a perpetual conflict in which a thesis or a force collides with an antithesis or a counterforce to create a new phenomenon called a synthesis. Eisenstein saw the collision of one shot or montage cell with another creating conflict that produced a new idea. This new idea would become its own thesis and collide with another antithesis, creating yet another synthesis idea. Again and again, these dialectics build up in a film, like a series of controlled explosions in an internal combustion engine, driving the film forward. Now, on the subject of editing, Eisenstein lists five methods of montage or how these collisions between shots can be created, each one building on the complexity of the previous one. The first and the most basic is the metric montage, cutting based purely on the length of the shot. This elicits the most basic emotional response, that of tempo, which can be raised or lowered for effect. Next is rhythmic montage, which is much like metric in that it's based on time and tempo, but rhythmic concerns with what's inside the frame as well. Cutting in tempo with the action. In this shot from Potemkin, the rhythm of the marching soldier's legs drives the movement of the sequence beyond the tempo of the cut. 
Next in complexity is the tonal montage, which isn't concerned with time, but with the tone of the shot from the lighting, the shadows, the shapes of the frame. Cutting between shots of different aesthetic tones creates these Marxist dialectics. Above that is overtonal, which is a larger scale macro cell that combines metric, rhythmic, and tonal montage, essentially how whole sequences play against each other. Then lastly was a type of montage that most interested Eisenstein, the intellectual or ideological montage. Whereas the previous methods focused on inducing emotional response, the intellectual montage sought to express abstract ideas by creating relationships between opposing visual intellectual concepts. A simple example in Battleship Potemkin is the intercutting of the priest tapping on the cross with an officer tapping on the hilt of a sword to express the message of a corrupt association between the church and the czarist regime. Another example is the final sequence in the Odessa Steps sequence, three quick shots of a rising stone lion representing the rise of the proletariat. So invested in the intellectual montage, Eisenstein dedicated his next film, October, a 10th anniversary recreation of the Bolshevik Revolution, to exploring its possibilities. Running at just under three hours with lots of intellectual and ideological montage cutting, October was an experimental film of immense proportion that ultimately left audiences cold. The wild cuts were simply too much for audiences to follow. While intellectual montage can evoke deep abstract ideas without being rooted in a strong narrative framework as it was in Battleship Potemkin, the intellectual montage was just too much abstraction for audiences to follow. Some film theorists, such as the French film critic André Bazin, claimed that the dialectical montage was too manipulative and too totalitarian in the way it seeks to control the audience by ignoring natural spatial and time relationships found in continuity editing or long takes. The debate may be a matter of taste, but the effects of early Soviet silent filmmakers and their montage theory would be refined and pushed even further in the 1950s as the French New Wave, as well as Hollywood visionaries like Alfred Hitchcock, began incorporating montage as part of their storytelling technique. With both the continuity style of D.W. Griffith, with the emphasis on clear, understandable space and time, and the Soviet montage style, which ignored space and time to create impact through the juxtaposition of different images, the rudiments of cinematic language emerged in roughly the first 30 years of cinema's existence, quickly making it a nuanced and intricate art form through experimentation and theory. These first film practitioners who studied and built on each other's work would in turn be studied and imitated by the next generation of filmmakers on and on, carrying the human tradition of storytelling. So be part of that tradition, study other filmmakers, and then go make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.